Welcome back. We're tying up our study on temperaments and how they relate to just everyday life. I think you'll enjoy today's lesson because it puts it practically where we live and kind of what we expect of ourselves and of other people. It's a reminder that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and so uniquely different to accomplish whatever God's purpose is on earth for us individually. So temperaments in everyday life and the goal through this series is to be filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit because without Christ, we're a big mess. Yeah, and we don't do anything very well without Him. I will say this about temperaments. You can almost look at somebody's face and tell a lot about their temperament. If they are smiling and talking and mm, kind of upbeat, you might lean toward the sanguine if they're kind of, mm, might lean a little more toward the introvert, a phlegmatic or maybe melancholy. Uh, and then a Choleric. They're the ones looking to see what needs to be done and willing to help everybody get it done. So anyway, we're talking about them. Our theme verse has been Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. He created us just like he wanted to for his mere pleasure. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, what we should be doing, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It was his plan from the very beginning that we just accept ourselves the way God made us some things we can change and should change, and some things we should just understand is what makes us uniquely the person God made us to be. So when we say temperament, it just refers to the God-given inherent traits that we have in ourselves. It makes up our being from birth. They're going to carry through our lives. A lot of things impact that. Um, experiences and circumstances and family, environment, education, a lot of things uh, impact what makes us the person that we are and how we respond to people and to everything around us, all the people and everything around us. Uh, this week in um, my history class, we are studying, we have been studying the religious movement through early America. And of course, that would include, you know, the, the famous preachers that we know. And uh, T. DeWitt Talmadge, who is renowned for his sermon, What Are They Now Doing in Heaven? And Employments in Heaven. What will we be doing the other side uh, of eternity? And this is what he says, and I thought it interesting that he even mentions temperament in it. He says, after God has put a, excuse me, after God has made a nature, he never eradicates the chief characteristics of its temperament. Conversion plants new principles in our soul, but Paul and John are just as different from each other after conversion as they were different from each other before conversion. I must, by inevitable laws of inference and deduction and common sense, conclude that in heaven we will be just as different from each other as we are now different. Hmm. So, and this is the thing, how would we recognize each other in heaven if we didn't have a lot of the same characteristics? Um, but you can look around and tell we're all different. Good news, bad news. We're all different. But truly, do, would we want everybody to be just the same? Just kind of um, even kill all the time. No, we love the people who bounce off the walls. They bring a lot of spark to our lives. But we also love the quiet, thoughtful ones, too. And so there are two extroverts as far as temperaments go and two introverts. The two extroverts obviously are talking and smiling and um, the, the two introverts are, are quiet. And so you can kind of easily figure out at least 50%, uh, you know, which 50% you, you go into. But diving deeper into this topic, um, we are going to think for just a second about the percentages because I think that's interesting. Across the board, as far as mankind goes, about 20% are sanguine. That's the social folks. 15% uh, are choleric, which just for me in the alliteration, I always think choleric, cranky. That doesn't necessarily mean they're cranky, but they are in charge. Uh, and just about 50%. And it reminds me too, it's the lowest percentage of the four temperaments. But if those are the leaders, obviously obviously the leaders, there would be fewer of those than there are of people who are following the leaders. Um, the melancholy, sometimes referred to as the moody ones, just because they're very introspective, 35%. They're just thinking through things, and aren't we glad some people are thinking these days? Then the phlegmatic, those are the peaceful ones, um, the peacemakers. 
Not sure there are as many of those as there used to be because some people start out at an 11. They never start out at a one and work their way up anymore. But anyway, sanguine choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic, and that's just percentage according to population. But remember this too, that while temperaments form a significant part of who we are, they aren't everything. A lot of things go into that, and being filled with the Holy Spirit makes a world of difference because even saved, even unsaved people have temperament. They have personality, and um, they think a certain way, depending on how God made them also. Uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 10, he talks about the unsaved, the unregenerate first, and all of the things that they're involved in and the way they think. But then he says this around verse 10, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, he says, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my charity, my patience, my persecutions, my afflictions, and how he handled all of that. He said, you know me. I've lived in front of you a certain way. And um, so they knew him and what difference Christ had made in his life as he does in our lives. And we're just reminded again, we are either in Christ or we are in trouble. So, so true. So anyway, we'll break it down just a little bit um, and talk about the sanguine first. I, I, in my mind, I have a certain order that they go in. And typically, sanguines are mentioned first. If you do any research at all on them, I will throw in here. Some people are so given to the temperaments. I do know of one college, and I might have mentioned it before in this series, where they advise people to marry or not marry someone depending on their temperament. Well, I don't know that we can just do that exactly. Um, they say opposites attract. And we know they do, but you still have to have some things in common. And um, the Holy Spirit, again, is playing into that role for sure. But the characteristics of the sanguine, these are the bubbly ones we've said. If you just stop, step to a room and just pause a minute and listen, the ones smiling and talking are the sanguines. They're bubbly and enthusiastic. They're social butterflies with an endless supply of energy. Their love for life is contagious. They make great company to be around. I was married to a sanguine. Uh, and choleric. Um, it's, it's, it's a nice combination. Um, we'll talk about that. They may or may not struggle with attention to detail. They usually make decisions easily. Um, and some people say too hastily. In some cases, um, we uh, know of a preacher, and it's been said of him, he makes poor decisions quickly, and he makes good decisions slowly. Hmm, think about that. But anyway, sanguines typically make decisions easily, and truthfully, a lot of times they're good decisions because they have the heart of the people. Uh, but in marriage, we're going to break it down to what these temperaments look like in marriage and what they look like just in fellowship and hospitality and relationships. But in marriage, they bring energy. They enjoy good conversation within the marriage. They just want to sit and talk to each other because they're talkers. They also enjoy conversation with strangers. They sure do. They're most compatible with someone who shares their thoughts, or at least their beliefs, their, their beliefs, their ideals. Um, if we're talking Christians, obviously the same God. They like to travel, but at, at home, their home body's at heart, um, if home is a safe haven. And people who are in the public eye all the time, they want to have a place where they can chill. They're a recliner. They want to not have to talk if they just want to rest. Um, so even though they're talkative most of the time. They do like their spot where they can settle down in their recliner. They're generous. They give easily to the people that they love, to the causes that they love. I have found sang sanguines to be good tithers, really and truly, because they get it and they, they want to give to what they love, who, whom they love. They're excellent listeners. I think this is one good telling thing about a spirit-controlled sanguine, somebody who truly loves they will lean in to talk to you. They will give you their eye contact. They might even reach over and touch your hand or your arm. Um, just leaning in, just to let you know they're connected to you. They have a great sense of humor. They laugh at themselves even to make others laugh. Uh, but they And they love the banter back and forth. Uh, we say in our, our, <laughs> our house, we still quote uh, Dave. He used to ask us questions just to kind of get us going, just for fun conversation. And he'd say, for a million dollars in the championship of the world. And then he would ask us something to see if we could get the answer right for our million dollars in the championship of the world. And we were prone to say, you didn't give us the million dollars from the last time we, we did this. But anyway, he loved the game, the banter. He loved the conversation. Um, he had a, a teacher one time who said, I hope God can take your sense of humor and use it for his glory. 
that teacher had any idea how God did just that. But in fellowship and hospitality, they like to entertain, but usually they depend on others. A lot of times they depend on others for the details. The food, what are we going to do with the kids? How long should this last? When should we plan it? A lot of those details, they're leaders. A lot of sanguines are leaders. Now that will play into the choleric. They create an atmosphere that makes everybody feel at home. They're just people, people, and they're relaxed. They don't get stressed out around people. They have a preference. This is interesting. I came across this in some of my resource materials that I have. They have a preference for spicy and crunchy foods because it fits their adventurous spirit. And I forgot to tell this story, um, but it made me think of it when I was doing the research and pulling this lesson together. We were on vacation one time, and we um, went through a drive through like a glorified Dairy Queen kind of place almost. I don't know. Anyway, close to the lake where we were staying, and we, we were going to go through the drive through and just take it and keep going. And when we pulled up to order, um, my husband told, after we had done our orders and he was going to do his, he said, I don't really know what I want. Just fix me anything. Whatever it is, it'll be fine. And they did. As we were pulling around to pay for it, I said, you have no idea what they'll fix or what that will cost. He said, oh, I don't care. We're good. Just let's, let's see what they come up with. So anyway, a favorite is there. there are, there's a spicy and crunchy food, but they are such they're such relaxed people usually, they'll just go with the flow. And sure enough, the lady fixed him for something of her liking and he paid for it and ate it and liked it. Um, they tend to invite more people over to their house if they're fellowshipping, hosting there. They tend to invite more people than their house can hold. Hmm, everybody's standing around because nobody, not everybody has a place to sit. Um, and they usually don't have an idea when to call it a night because they just enjoy people um, so much. They'll literally say anything, so they talk easily to the crowd at their house, and it's okay that they're standing, because they think everybody just loves the conversation. Um, we were on um, an elevator one time, and a young lady stepped on there, and she had piercings everywhere, like literally everywhere. Her eyebrows, her nose, her lip, her belly button, like everywhere. Multiples everywhere. And my husband looked at her, total stranger, he had no idea, and he said, I bet all that hurt, didn't it? She said, you have no idea. He said, but it cost a lot of money too, didn't it? She said, yeah, it really did. And he said, to my horror, he said, and like when you drink water, does it leak? You, like there are so many holes, does it leak? She died laughing. You would have thought they were good friends by the time the elevator opened and stepped off. Not offended. Sanguins are very good at saying whatever comes to mind that they want to say for the conversation, and people tend to not be offended with sanguines, offended by them. Um, in, spiritual, in spiritual things, I don't want you to miss this, sanguines enjoy a close relationship with the Lord, and it's been said that in their mind, it's like a child curling up in a parent's lap. They just love him that much. They see Jesus as their best friend, someone they can lean on when their world is difficult or hard. They rejoice with those who rejoice, and they weep with those who weep, which is exactly what the Bible tells us to do. Uh, sometimes they can't help but get lost in worship. You might hear them singing louder than anybody else sometimes. Um, they might lift their hands um, when they're singing, close their eyes, and just look up and soak in the Lord. And sanguines are known for that. A good Bible example of a sanguine is Peter. We know he talked easily. Sometimes when he should not have been talking, Peter talked. Uh, do you remember he invited Jesus over to his house? His mother-in-law, who was going to who typically would be helping host whoever comes over, was sick with a fever. And Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Like he invited her over knowing there's sick people in the house. Invited, invited Jesus over knowing there's sick people in the house. And when Jesus had healed her, she got up and fed them and served them. Uh, so Peter is a good character for sanguines. Remember he was rebuked by Jesus. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, because he talked easily. When he decided to go fishing, the other disciples said, we'll go with you. Yeah. Um, he was optimistic. He stepped out to walk on water because he believed he could. He was walking toward his Lord. He preached on the day of Pentecost. So many factors kind of play into probably the temperament to help you know to Peter better than you've ever known him before. Uh, Psalm 32, 11 is a good verse for sanguine. Be sanguines. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And then choleric, these are the rule keepers. Some people are just intense. Those are the choleric people. Um, they're just hardcore. If you know anybody who leans toward intensity, they probably fall in this category, at least to a certain percentage. Um, they do. They get things done because God 
uh, things get done because God put uh, this personality on earth. They're mission-minded, they're intense, they're quick thinkers, they're decisive, they rarely let a good challenge get away. Like the outgoing sanguine, choleric people fall into the extra for, extrovert category. Um, so in marriage, what are they? They're not just comfortable, but they're assertive, they're large and in charge. Um, they have a long-range plan in mind for house and home. Uh, my husband even had his... Um, he had all his plans, like a five-year plan, 10-year plan. He was a visionary. He was, I told him the only thing he was more than uh, sanguine is choleric, um, but he did it well. He was intense. He had a vision. He could get things done, uh, but he even had um, his checkbook was color-coded. That's how picky he was about things and his long-range plans, short-range plans, what's happening. He kept up, liked to travel. Cholerics like to travel, but they're prone to combine business with pleasure. If by chance you're listening and you're married to a preacher, he might schedule to preach. Somebody might schedule him to preach and he accepts it when you're on vacation, those kind of things. They're particular about how money is spent. The cholerics are. They do their homework. Um, they give to certain projects. They're intensely loyal and expect loyalty from those around them. I know one preacher... Um, I think out in California is where he is. But he has a plaque in his office that says, be loving, be loyal, or be gone. Yeah, loving, getting things done, loving people. But if you can't be loyal, to I, loyal, loyal, I can't keep you. Um, sometimes cholerics come across as aggressive or domineering. Uh, in fellowship and hospitality, they are outgoing by nature. They enjoy socializing. They love competition and team sports. That's another factor for cholerics. Some people don't like team sports. They like to work individually, but cholerics like the competition. They're adventurous and love to use their, um, even if, if, depending on male, female, whoever likes, to, who has culinary um, uh, ability, they like to create things. They enjoy group dinners, networking events, brainstorming sessions. Uh, they're more time conscious sometimes than the sanguines. They might even announce if you have company at your house, it's time to go home. Yeah, withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house first is what that is. So in spiritual things, they easily relate to justification, hmm. which sometimes causes their harsh side to show. Um, they have a good understanding of God's kingdom and what needs to be done. They're opinionated, but often give generously to the church because it, hel it helps the church accomplish its goals. They sometimes struggle with spiritual spiritual authority because of their own take charge personality. They're true workers for God when they're spirit controlled. They have a doer attitude that often invades their time with God if they're not being controlled by the spirit on their time. Um, a Bible example of that, a couple of them, Mary, Mar, excuse me, Martha at Bethany. Remember, she was up busy working. Jesus was in the house and she was up busy working. Um, then what about Paul? He had so many run-ins with Pharisees, but God used him to write a majority of the New Testament, and God used him to help turn the world upside down, according to Acts 17, 6. So yeah, they're getting things done. Um, I love Paul's verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, and you've heard me quote it before. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. He didn't mind working. He worked hard before he was saved and after he was saved. He just said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He knew his shortcomings, and he acknowledged them and accepted God's plan for his life. Then the third one is melancholy. They're known for, their, for being thoughtful and introspective. These individuals often enjoy spending time alone, reflecting on life's mysteries. They possess a deep sense of empathy, which makes them excellent listeners, but their tendency toward overthinking can lead to unnecessary worry or stress. Melancholies are probably the most um, stressed, um, worried kind. They tend to be highly thoughtful, analytical, detail-oriented. They're all about planning ahead, and they take their responsibilities very seriously. So what do they bring to a marriage? They're detail-oriented and proficient in helping keep up house and home. They're deeply thoughtful. Good news, bad news. I have a melancholy daughter, and I used to have to say to Meredith, don't think anymore. Just you're overthinking. Stop thinking. Um, they tend to be self-reflective and critical of themselves. They choose to lead quiet, detailed, organized lives. They mentally file away information in case it's needed later. That's the airport thing. Like they would be the ones that would hear what gate over the intercom 
and they just file it away in case they need it later. They are loving and loyal. They draw lines quickly if betrayed or if somebody that they love is betrayed. They're creative and can see and add beauty that often eludes the other personalities. I would say too, in housekeeping, they tend to group things well. Have you ever put something on the wall or you haven't put something on the wall because you can think, what else needs to go with that? Well, melancholies, melancholies, uh, think through that. And they're very good at grouping things. They're creative like that. In fellowship and hospitality, they want their house to be perfect before they invite company over. Some people don't realize that their house is a wreck if they invite people over. Not melancholies. They thought through it all and they want everything in place. They value tradition. They long remember food and recipes and memories from years gone by. Some people, like, if somebody you know can't remember something that you remember, you're probably, possibly, a melancholy, and they are not. Um, I tell my girls, I file things away. If I finish it and I don't think I'm going to need it, I don't have time to contain that in my brain. <laughs> I just file it away. And then if they say, Mom, do you remember? I'm like, I don't. I don't remember what you're talking about. Um, it's not that um, I'm, I'm losing my memory. It just I, I guess I didn't think I needed to keep that at the moment. But anyway, uh, they're deeply loyal. They don't invite anyone over to their house who gives off uncertain vibes. If they don't know where you stand, they're probably not inviting you to their house. They don't always put people at ease because they are so quiet and introspective and even self-conscious. They love to have deep conversations, but only with trusted friends. They're not going to share any personal information with somebody that's not a close friend. Um, they value true friends and will guard friends' secrets at all costs. Uh, it's just the kind of person they are. They're prone to buy, choose, use, and keep sentimental things. It could be dishes or art or a piece of furniture or a knickknack or something like that. They tend to hang on to those sentimental things. In spiritual things, they are constant seekers of personal perfection. We should probably all be like that. They have difficulty reconciling forgiveness for those that they don't feel deserve it. <clears throat> They have a special reverence for worship, for the Bible, for spiritual decisions that they make, vows they make to God. Um, they desire to help their children grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If they're saved and they're, they're consecrated to the Lord, they desire that for their children, which we should all do for sure. They usually prefer a quiet corner in the church. However, they do like for their friends to walk up and talk to them. Even though Sometimes their friends might think, even their friends might think, well, I don't know. She doesn't look approachable or what, what, whatever that comes across as when they're so quiet. They have a firm belief and it's better to not make a vow to the Lord or to anybody than to make a vow and, and not keep it, as we know from Ecclesiastes 5.4 about keeping vows. So a good Bible example there, one is Moses. Remember, he tried to persuade God to have Aaron, his brother, talk for him. He wasn't a talker. Meekest man in all the earth, the Bible says. So he would have been in the melancholy category as far as as far as his personality before God threw him out there <laughs> to have him do something for him and gave him what he needed to get it done, even though he was meek and mild. Another one might be Mary, the mother of Jesus. Remember in Luke 2, 19, she kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She was just thinking through them, quietly thinking. I always wonder what must she have been thinking standing at the foot of the cross. Just all of the thoughts going through her mind, all the memories, all everything. Uh, a good verse for melancholies is Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Good verse for melancholy. Uh, and then the last one here is the phlegmatic. This is calmness personified, and don't we all need those in our families? We need some peacemakers, some calm people in our families. Those with a phlegmatic disposition typically display patience beyond measure, along with the peaceful demeanor that can soothe even the most turbulent souls around them. Of all the personality types, the whatever goes phlegmatic probably is the one who has the easiest time embracing God and Christianity. Um, and I think it's because that peace that they're looking for, they find that in the Lord. But in marriage, they desire a deep heart connection, but they sometimes have a hard time expressing it. Even their spouses might wonder what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. They're deeply hurt by any kind of rejection in marriage and everything. They invest their emotions wholeheartedly, even to the point of emotional exhaustion. And the interesting thing is sometimes you may not even know what their emotions are, but they can exhaust themselves by all their emotions going on inside them. They value harmony and feel overwhelmed and burdened if tension exists. They do not like tension. 
Sometimes they come across as being unsatisfied or bored due to their lack of expression. You just don't know how to read them. They plan romantic evenings and getaways well in advance to enjoy thinking about it. They may sweep things under the rug, as the saying goes, just to avoid conflict and avoid talking about it. They don't want to do that. In fellowship and hospitality, uh, they enjoy fellowship, but they're prone not to talk at all. I have a friend who's a phlegmatic, um, and in the middle of a crowd, she'll sit in the middle of the talkers, and she may sit there for an hour, hour and a half at a table, and never say a word. She's a phlegmatic. Um, they probably would love for her to say something, but she does not usually. They may prefer potluck get-togethers where their food can remain anonymous. <laughs> they don't want anybody judging, uh, and they're not going to judge you either. Hmm. They're slow to make food choices in a long line or when out to eat looking at a menu. They're slower about that than everybody else at the table usually. They like making plans ahead of time and look forward to the event with a bit of trepidation because they don't know what to expect. They can be frustrated if others are not as committed as they are. And we see that like serving, maybe their gift that we're going to talk about next uh, week, spiritual gifts. Maybe their, um, their other's gifts are not serving, but if a phlegmatic is serving and she's prone to do that, she might be frustrated when others are not serving. But in spiritual things, they hungrily embrace the peace found by faith in Jesus Christ. It's been said that they it's almost a feeling, if you could understand them, like soaking in a bubble bath or something. They're just like, oh, this feels so good. Just the peace of God. They have the easiest time accepting uh, God's sovereignty. They just go with it. They go with the flow, as the saying goes. They're good to let God work behind the scenes on their behalf. Uh, they tend to let others sweat the hard things rather than jumping in. They may become discouraged when comparing oneself themselves to other Christians. Um, but Hannah, if you remember, she just suffered silently. I always think, Hannah, why didn't you just say something to Penina who was driving you crazy? But that's the extrovert in me coming out. I get that. Uh, but she didn't do that until she had had all she could take. And then she poured her heart out to God. Yeah. And um, then another example would be Mary of Bethany, Martha and Mary, that Mary. Um, but when Martha was up running around and getting things done and feeling the liberty to speak, like the extrovert that she was, what was Mary doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet, just soaking him in and getting that peace that her soul craved for sure. Um, in whom, uh, Ephesians 1.11 says this, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And so I would encourage you to look around, look at your friends, look at the people that God's brought into your life. You can probably figure out even by their faces uh, what it is that uh, they are, what temperament, and it will help you understand them better. I actually had, had this uh, poster for um, Bible study in-house. If you'll look at the faces on there, if I can get above there, uh, you can tell which one is which just by the look on their faces. Um, if they're uh, a little worried, if they're outgoing and they're smiling, or if they look like they're in charge. like You can look around and tell by their faces, but God made us all uniquely as we are. This is where we just thank the Lord. By the grace of God, I am what I am and ask the Lord to do with us what it is that he wants us to do so that we accomplish his purpose. Uh, for us um, on this earth. We're waiting for him to return. I think that will be soon. And uh, we want to be found being faithful until the end, regardless of what temperament we are. But whatever it is, it was God-given. Let's use it for his honor and glory. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the privilege to uh, glean from your word, the verses that we've talked about, Lord, and think about the way you uniquely made us. We're all each unique different DNA, even in our, our own hands and feet, uh, the prints are different. And Lord, we're just uh, so uniquely made and so uh, uniquely yours. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. I pray that you might help us truly to accomplish the purpose you have for each one of us, Lord, that when we stand before you, you can say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, and we can enter into your joy and your reward and, and eternity that you have planned for us. We love you. Thank you for loving us. For it's in Jesus' sweet and precious and holy name we pray these things. Amen. Hope to see you next week.